All right. Um, on behalf of International Association of African Authors and Scholars, I want to welcome you all to the 2018 exhibition of the association. We are grateful that you're here today. It's been um, a long haul after the 2017 edition, which was the maiden, right here in Atlanta. It was beautiful. And we also trust in God that today will be better than what we had in 2017. Quickly, we are running behind schedule. We propose to begin at 10. But you know, like they say, like they say, um, African time. But we are not happy that that is happening, but by reason of certain technical issues. But right now, we are about to begin. And we are glad we have your presence this morning. And for us to start, we want to quickly commit this meeting into the hands of the Almighty, the creator of heaven and the earth, the one who has given us life and breath, the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith, the one who by his grace we are living and we have been able to articulate and to write books, articles that is making the great difference in our world, leaving lasting legacy that is moving our world forward. And this morning we want to call on Brother Obi Okoma to give us an opening prayer. Thank you. Our God, who keeps everybody alive today, who gives us life, who gives us breath, who brought us here today in good health. We pray, Almighty God, <coughs> that what we are going to do today be very, very fruitful. We pray for the benefit and for the moving forward of International Association of African Authors and Scholars to benefit all humankind, to benefit all who are present here, so that we keep faith and make sure that we move forward and make sure that it progresses and put all our efforts and make sure that this exhibition community is uh, moving ahead. Also, when we finish here today, the way you give us good health and brought us here, when we do everything we finished and when we are ready to go home, please take us in peace to wherever we come from so that everybody will go in peace without any issues. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I just want to briefly recognize and appreciate the presence of um, everyone here while we also wait for those who are yet to arrive. Right now we have supporters in our midst and some guests. I'm glad to have the presence of um, Dr. Cornelius Itimofo. You're welcome, sir. 
Thank you for coming. We also have in our presence Ms. Sunny Thank you. You're welcome, ma'am. Nice to see you again. <laughs> we also have in our midst another great author, Sunday Joseph Botero. You're welcome, sir. I also have another wonderful author here. You just said the opening prayer. Don't be performer. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. And we also have another guest who is also making a presentation and a speech today. She said she had to call her AJA. <laughs> <laughs> AJA, awesome. Nice to have you. Lawrence Eka, yes. Thank you, that's it's also my pleasure to welcome the brothers of Lawrence Air Dynamics. You're welcome. Thank you. And um, last but not the least for now, my pleasure to introduce the executive director of the association. You know that person, but she did it way. You're welcome, guys. Executive Director. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure. While we await the arrival of other members and friends and guests, we also have other guests in our midst. Um, I'll have them introduce themselves quickly. At least I appreciate their presence here with us this morning as we proceed. I'll pass the mic to my young friend. Okay, who? Also, Thank you for Thank you for coming to show support to your father. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, directly behind the team, you have. Uh, Hi, my name is Obiano Wow. Also, Obiano Gil Kuforma. That also is Kuforma's daughter. Thanks for coming. I appreciate that. I still have some here. I love you here. Um, I'm a very rich mother. It's my parents here. Wow. You want to get it? That's what you want to get it. Caroline is my mother. They're for second Wow. You're welcome. Thank you. You're the best, sir. I think you have. Let's take more for here. Let me take more for here. Let me take more for here. Let me take more for here. Wow. That's beautiful. So, this is family thing. And that is exactly what we are trying to do in IAF. The International Association of African Authors and Scholars is an association that is aimed at bringing African authors and scholars together. Helping us leap ahead of the challenges we have in publishing. Many authors complain of being ripped. They don't get much from what they invest. Intellectual property being stolen. But we trust that and hope that as we continue to harness our intellectual resources and synergize that we'll be able to break from this shadow of authors ripping up of publishers ripping up. We are so trusting God that this association will live beyond the boundaries of what is keeping authors from progressing. A lot of authors Publish and they don't make nothing for it, in spite of the intellectual investment, the time, the resources, everything put into it, yet they don't get nothing. But we hope and trust that as we continue to meet and gather and share ideas, rock minds, 
that we'll be able to propagate the idea of it and sell these authors beyond the limitation that they face. We're hoping to see IAS be a hub for African authors online where we can harness all the material and see how we can push it to the world and people can get access to the work. And we are looking forward to that time where I will be the first association to bring about an African Nobel. Someday it might be We need to do it in the African way. Let's tell our own story. No one can tell the story of you like you. Nobody can do it better than you can do it. If we continue to wait for other people to tell our story, they only tell the story from their perspective. If we want to tell our story from our perspective about who we are, how far we have come, and how far we are going. They see people see things from different sides. Some see a cup of water, a cup of water half full, some see it half empty. Whatever way you say it, you're telling almost the same thing. But what perspective? Africans have been shortchanged for too long. African professionals and authors have been shortchanged for too long. And we are trusting God that this will be an avenue that will give us that push to showcase us in our own way and help us achieve and actualize our dreams and goals. So, in that day, we are encouraging everyone to be involved. And that is why, like we say, in this association, get involved and be heard. You can't be heard from afar. You need to be in the family. And let's help ourselves actualize and agree. We can only do that when we synergize together. When we work as a team. A great man once said that teamwork makes a good work. If we don't work together, if we continue to fight among ourselves, then we won't get nowhere. We won't actualize this goal. We won't bring it to fruition. I believe in one philosophy that everything is possible. But that possibility is absolutely dependent on your, on your optimism about your pursuit. A lot of people have this pessimistic pessimist mind, they, they doubt even themselves. Yet they are doing something, but they are not confident about how far it can go. But, um, I'm a very optimistic person. Whatever I pursue, I pursue it vigorously. With everything in me. And as far as this association is concerned, I have bought into it. I see far beyond where we stand right now. And the pictures that run in my mind is that someday, just like I said, a novel will emerge from this house. I don't know who it's going to be. But like, what you're trying to do at the end of today, the day, you'll be a book, an outstanding book that. Why are we doing that? We're just trying to galvanize our groups and encourage each other that your effort is appreciated. The work you have put in 
We appreciate it. As our own. And as we progress, their work prices increase. And when it gets to that point where it comes to the in Africa, it comes with a whole lot of privilege. It's going to come with a whole lot in the package. But right now, from where we are, I want to be sure that our story is told. You know, last year I, I was looking at Sanyoko's work. She was talking about who we are and where we are coming from. You look at that picture and kiss it. It's a picture of what we're talking about. What people do not know because they are not told. Because they want to hide the truth of the effects of what the Africans have gone through. They would have told that story. They would have told that story. Because it's our story. And those who are writing like books like academics, like Dr. Jimbo work. Writing from the perspective of a grounded professional who understands what it takes in human resource management. And all of us should be able to personalize ourselves and gather that idea that we put down by us. I look forward today that at the end of today's meeting, we'll be able to connect, network. Some people have material that doesn't even know how to publish. Right here, we have people who can help you do that. Some are having difficulty in even to bring their work. Right here, we have the professionals who can help you do that. That is the idea, that is the concept. Among us, we help each other to life. It be my pleasure to invite to the podium the executive director of business association, Chinedum Iwe, for his welcome address. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, happiness is just a word. I can say for now and for today and for always because there is future, there's vision for what we are trying to present to the world through this association, International Association of African Authors and Scholars. Not just for ourselves, but collectively for Africa and the, the globe in general. My address is actually in the magazine, the Discover magazine, <laughs> which we are launching and promoting today alongside our author's books. So my address is there, but I want to, you guys, we have an opportunity to read it in full detail, but I still want to highlight some areas of interest regarding a way forward for International Association of African Authors and Scholars. Through this association, African authors, you have a platform now. A platform you can call your own or our own. A platform that's already has been established for you to use and show your creative work. I keep hearing all the time that nobody can tell the African story except Africans. 
that is the reason behind the creation of International Association of African Authors and Scholars, for we, the authors from Africa, to have our own mouthpiece and then let others hear from us directly. So, authors spend a lot of time writing books. There is need to have a platform, a place. We can always come together once in a year and network, share ideas, get more suggestions, and help each other, empower each other. AJ knows more about empowerment. <laughs> she's at the back there, and she's very much ready to be part of us. Also, our fans, those that are going to read our books, those that read our books, my message to you is that there is a, a platform now where you can meet these authors directly. The authors, you read their books, you buy their books, or you think about them, you hear about them in the news. This platform, International Association of African Authors and Scholars Annual Book Exhibition, is for you, our readers, to really meet these people, these, creator, these creative uh, artists that you read their work. There's no other place that's better than a place like this, something like this. It's not a television show. It's not a movie. It's a live event. So, to our friends and the guests and the fans and readers, this is a way where you can support these authors by buying their books and appreciating their profile and who they are. That is exactly why this magazine was actually started in, in that direction. You can see the name, Discover African Authors and Promote African Authors. It is now established alongside the association to discover, promote, and write about us in our own way. So contributors are welcome to have areas of specialty you can work or write about. The information on how to, I mean, contact the editor who happened to be the general secretary of the association that Charles Uti over there. If you want to have a column or something you have to want to write about every year, this is an opportunity now. You can now showcase your talent. Have it written or ready to be written to be read here because you'll be known. Next year, by God's grace, we are going to start a drive to involve all African embassies in the United States to be part of this magazine. Their, their information, their services, where they are, will be here. And at the same time, our authors, where we are, will be here for them. They will know us. It's like a symbiotic, biological relationship. People will know us, and we will know them. The other purpose of this very association that is very necessary is, well, promoting book reading is there, no doubt about that. We all read and write, but most importantly, you cannot promote book reading without having a library where those books can be preserved and managed. During my, after our event last year, I think November 13 or 14, I traveled to University of Manitoba, Canada. They invited me, basically because of this association, because it's a very much international oriented uh, university. There we are the ones that said that library services in Africa is very essential. Because promoting book reading should go a long way of having where to read those books. 
in African cities, you can go miles without having a library. And this association is focused on that aspect as our trying to provide, promote the libraries that are there, if they can be upgraded, we do that. That is the vision of the association. So that in African cities, people that can move, can move around and see where the books will be and read them. More importantly, our website we is going to start serving a very big role for our, for our members. From next year, we want our members, their books, to be sold on that website. In that case, the association will help the authors, which is the core objective of this association, promote and discover so that when people buy the books directly, it's, it, it's supposed to be a, 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 a store, an online store for our members so that they can, their books will be sold. It's not just about writing them on, on a line, but the, the, the work itself, the full pay, uh, book will be on display and the, the prizes and all the rest of it. So our members, we, we, have, we have job to do to really make sure that we take this whole association to the next, no, not even the next, to the upper level. And we can do it. Africa is a big continent with very, very intelligent, creative people. If, if there's a platform for that, let's use it. Which brings me to the motto of the association, get involved to be heard. So it is my pleasure to welcome all of you and wish you all well, wish us well as we provide a platform for Africa. This is an African pride. The association is making progress and we will do more with membership, active membership participation so that we can deliver our progress and objectives to the world. I thank you all for coming. Please be comfortable and be happy and let's do it. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Chile um, Demigwe. That was an um, eloquent um, delivery of the vision, the mission of International Association of African Authors and Scholars. Basically, when I was talking, he was not seated, right? Yes. But we were saying almost the same thing because we were speaking one mind. We have one mind, one vision, one dream, and one goal to see this association soar. That everybody will be carried along. And so as we proceed this morning, before we move to the book signing, <coughs> we have in our midst a motivational speaker, a master business coach. And this morning she'll be talking on publishing. Sorry, the microphone is not um, responding properly, but at least you can all hear our voice. Awesome. Before the ad invention of microphone, people spoke to thousands of people with their voice. I watched Martin Luther King talk to a crowd of thousands, and he was talking with his voice, and they heard, and they were inspired, and they moved. And today, the black community is a different place. And this morning, join me as I welcome AJA Austin. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're alive, you guys. Someone would love to be sitting where you are. Can I get a good morning? Good morning. Uh, yeah, okay, y'all. <laughs> Happy Saturday. Welcome to my side of Atlanta. My name is Andrika J. Austin. I go by Coach AJ for short. I'm founder of a business that's been in existence for the last 13 years right here in West Georgia. I'm originally 
born and raised right down the street. So again, you guys are on my side of Atlanta, okay? I'm so excited to be here. As the introduction said with Dr. Uti, I am a master business coach. I work with women entrepreneurs, helping them to make more money in their business. Raise your hand if you could use more money. Nobody, two people, okay, I got y'all, I got you, I got you. How many authors do we have? You already published. One, two, three, four. Anybody thinking of writing a book? Maybe one day soon? One day? What's your book gonna be about? Mm, me. Me? Yeah. <laughs> That's it? Yeah. Okay, you like a life story? Sure. Got it, okay. And you said you got one you're thinking of maybe one day? Mm -hmm. Okay. It'll be mostly in my career and uh, being here in America. Awesome. Where are you from? I'm from Nigeria. Nigeria. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so uh, I was sitting in the back talking with one of our attendees here today, and we discovered or rediscovered for me that I'm 35% Cameroon. And so <laughs> I took the DNA test a couple months ago. So I'm proud to be among my people, okay? <laughs> so thank you guys so much for allowing me to be here. Um, so I know we have authors. We have some people thinking about it. Anyone else, maybe you've published a book and it's just kind of, you've written it, but it's sitting on your computer drive. Like, eh, maybe one day I'll do something with it. Nobody? Okay. Still working on it. Got it. Thank you for being honest, okay? So just a quick background. Um, I am, again, originally from here, Douglasville, Georgia, born and raised, um, but I'm usually the foreigner. People say, you from here? What are you doing here? And I'm like, I live here. I'm from here. So I, it took me, I grew up here, but I graduated Mercer University. It sits on this same street that we're on right here. But it took me about 15 years to complete that college journey. And as a lot of you know, which probably is the reason your book isn't out yet, or you're still working on it, or you're thinking about it, life happens. And so my life happened, again, 15 years, took me to get that degree, but I did it. Mercy University class of 2016, right behind where we are. Um, and then about 10 years ago, I was leaving divorce court. Y'all caught that, right? Leaving divorce court, walking down the hallway to get on the elevator. And as I pushed the down button and the doors begin to open, I stepped on. And I turned around and I watched the doors close and I seen my now ex-husband for the last time. And then my phone rang in my pocket. Now, you know, on an elevator, you don't really get good phone service. But I took a chance, answered my phone, hello. And I'm glad I picked it up, took a chance on that elevator because it was my cousin, Nika. She lives right down the street. She was calling to tell me that my mom had just passed away. Oh. Right. So now, you know, 15 years for school, divorce is final, mom just passed. So all of that, that just how you just responded, imagine me times 10. <laughs> so here I am, downtown Decatur, Georgia, standing in the middle of the street, looking up at the sky like, God, what do you want me to do? And what he had me to do was come back here to Douglasville, handle my mother's affairs, took care of her home um, for the last 10 years I've been back here. And I'm glad that I did. Some friends convinced me like, AJ, it's okay, go home, handle your mother's affairs. She was an entrepreneur for about 13 years, but when she passed, she was only 47 years old. Exactly. So I want you to think about that. Cause she had invested 13 years of her life into a business that went to the grave with her. So for those of you who have not written that book, have not told your story like we've heard earlier, it's time. Someone needs to hear your story, hear about your career, hear about you. Write the book, tell the story, because it's powerful. So I'm glad I came back here to Douglasville because I was able to sit with myself, sit with that story and process everything that was happening. And then you know how in life it feels like just one thing after another. So I told y'all my business, right? 15 years to graduate college, divorce and mother dying on the same day. Well, while I was out for bereavement, handling my mother's funeral arrangements, my corporate position called, I had taken off of work that day. And they said, AJ, we know you're out. We know you're handling your mother's affairs, but unfortunately, when you come back, there's no job for you to come back to. Oh, no. Right, she said, oh no. <laughs> no job for you to come back. So here I am, all of these life decisions having to be made. But what if I told you that all of those things ended up being a business building blessing in disguise? Thank you, thank you for that, I received that. 
So the reason I say that is because I want you to, again, think about what you've been through, think about your story, and think about how it can inspire other people who need to hear it. Yes, in Africa, where you're from, but also here in the US, we need to know what have you been through? I spoke to my brother recently. I have uh, two other siblings. I'm the oldest and the only girl. This is my middle brother. He spent about 16 years, the last 16 years of his life incarcerated, but he wrote a book. So I want you to think again, what's holding you back? Cause this is a man that's behind bars and literally by hand wrote a book, mailed it to me, 300 pages front and back. And he has a book. So I know a lot of uh, people from other countries come to the U.S. looking for better opportunities. Use this time to get the book out, sell the books you already have, and tell your story. So here we are back here in Douglasville, Georgia. I sat with my story. I went through uh, with my brothers and things with my mom, just trying to piece it all together. And I said, God, I remember sitting in my cubicle wanting to be free. How many of y'all know what that's like? Nine to five, could want to be anywhere but there, right? And here I was with the opportunity. So yes, my mom is gone, ex-husband is gone, but this is my opportunity to build the life that I sat at work dreaming about, job is gone. And I said, God, I want to take this time and focus on the business that I sat in my cubicle sketching about, talking on the phone to customers, but really dreaming about. So I took the last few years to sit with myself, sit with my story, I wrote a book, this is book number nine of 10. Wow. That's how much time to sit with my story I had. This book is called Secrets of a Social Pranista. And I talk about the top eight mistakes I see a lot of entrepreneurs make that leave them broke, stuck, and struggling in their business. Uh, I come, came to find out that 70% of women small business owners here in the US make less than $25,000 a year. And I knew that was a problem. So I spoke with about 1,500 businesswomen to see what their top struggles were, and that's what's in this book. And we realized why they weren't making money is because the theme of today's event, they weren't telling their story. Everything I just told you guys, most people would be embarrassed to share. But now I get paid to share that story. So that's why I want to encourage you to put it in a book, and it's OK. Publish it, and it's OK. Because someone needs to hear it, and someone will pay you to hear it. So now I'm here in Douglasville. I work with a lot of women entrepreneurs here and globally, um, helping them to get their stories out, write their first book, and make money as they travel and speak and share their book and their story. Once a year, right down the street, it's coming up next Sunday, November 11th, I'm doing a book writing intensive. We'll be together for 10 hours writing your story and your book. I have two spots available. If you're interested, I'll be happy to share more with you. This copy of my book is on hand today. I only have five copies left before my 10th book comes out. So I brought all I had today, and it's $15. I take cash, checks, and credit cards. That's my motto. I also help women make cash, checks, and credit cards, okay? So I wanna take a moment to answer any questions that you may have about what it took for me to take everything that I've been through, package it up in a book, and make, I made 13,000 on this last one. So this is a five-figure story, and all my business ain't even in here. That's coming up in the next one, okay? So this is a five-figure book. My 10th book is already a six-figure book, and I would love to answer what it took to get 10 books out, make money on it, and now help women tell their story. So I'm here as a part of the International Association of African Authors. I've been practicing that to help you know what your next step is. So again, whether you are an author already, you have a book out and you're just looking to sell it and make more money, ask me a question about what it takes to get that publishing to the next level. A lot of you are already self-published authors. If you're the author who's considering writing a book, ask me questions, I'm here. Um, I I'm not here all day and I don't wanna take up all the time, but I do wanna just take a moment to answer any questions that you have about being a self-published author. Yeah, my question is, who is your publisher and how do you market your books? Great question. So who do you guys think published these last 10 books? Self-published. Self-published. Self <laughs> so AJ Austin owns the rights to all of my books. I'm a self-published author. Let me tell you how it became one. Um, sitting at home with all the time to sit, think, and write, I watched a lady on Facebook for several weeks. And when she would post on Facebook, she was bragging about all the books she had sold with this new book. And people were taking pictures. I sold 10 books today. And I said, OK, God, I see her posts. And some of them have typos. And I'm not judging. But if she can write a book, I know I can write a book. So instead of judging her, I let her story inspire me. And I reached out in her inbox saying, hey, can you tell me the next steps 
to take. I know I want to write a book. I got the time to do it. Tell me what to do. And she did it. And from there, I was unstoppable. So I formed my own publishing company, Journey Girl Publishing, which is one of my first companies. That big business that I was trying to launch sitting in that cubicle from nine to five. That's what company I publish under as a self-published author. And that's what I now teach ladies how to publish your own books, because that means you keep all your profits. You can do whatever you want to with it, host events like I'm doing next Sunday, um, and make the most money that you can versus a traditional publisher who owns a lot of the rights and you have to get their permission to take your book to the next level. How I market my book is things like this. I'm here on Facebook Live. People tune in from around the world to see me travel and speak. Um, and I also, I do the Facebook Lives, the YouTubes, the LinkedIn's, uh, Twitter. I'm everywhere on social media. And I also travel and speak at different people's events like today here in Atlanta and abroad. And I just make sure that I'm always sharing about my book on different podcasts. <laughs> I've been in the newspaper, on television. And so I put together a marketing program now to help women do the same thing based on what has worked successfully for me just here in the Atlanta area to bring in 13,000 with this last book. So that's just in a nutshell what I do to market. I'll be happy to talk with you more and share more if you have additional questions afterwards. Okay, thank you. Hope that helped. <laughs> <coughs> yes. Um, how old is your book and how long did it take for you to, to write it? Great question. So I wrote this book in 2015. It came out in 2016. It took me uh, 24 hours to write this book. And that's what I teach women how to do now. So as I was writing this book, God gave me the idea like, okay, this is book number nine of 10. You're ready to teach this. And so I formed a program called Right Now and talks about how to write your book in 24 hours or less based on what I did with this book here. So she's maybe two years old now. And uh, yes, 24 hours. And so people say, AJ, is it possible to write a book in 24 hours? It absolutely is. Come on in. This is my friend Jessica, you guys. She's from my office space down the street. So this is one of how marketing works. She showed up because I told her on Facebook that I was here today. So perfect example. Uh, so yes, it's possible to write a book in 24 hours based on how you have your book set up. And so just on the way here, I was praying because I want to continue to work with authors even after my event next week. And so for six weeks, four hours a week equals what? How many hours is that? 24 hours. I'm going to be working with ladies here in Atlanta live to get their books out. So based on how you set up that 24 hours, it's possible. Any other questions? No publishing questions? I thought I was here to talk about publishing today. <laughs> no one has publishing questions. So the reason I ask is because I want to make sure I cover what you guys have questions about, okay? I don't want to just give you information just because. Yes? I have just completed my manuscript and I'm in the process of publishing. How do I go about publishing it? So what type of book is it? Fiction, nonfiction? Fiction. Would you consider it self-help? Would you consider it inspirational? Adventure. Adventure, great. Okay, and what have you done so far to get it published? Uh, so far, I've been looking for a proof, a proof reader. Proof reader. So there are, I would say, if you if it's just a finished manuscript, there are different types of uh, proof readers, if you will. You have your editors. You have uh, editors just will kind of look at your book and say, okay, it's good to go. Line editors will read every line in your book and say, okay, this doesn't make sense. Let me help you make this flow. And then the proofreader, um, what was the other one? Editor, line editor. I would start with an editor before a proofreader to make sure your ideas flow right. I hope I'm saying that in the right order, getting turned around. So yeah, um, editor first. My books all go through at least 10 editing processes. That's why I say they're different types of editors because the first one is you. You go back and you try to fix it. Some of y'all probably edit while you write and erase and start over again. Send it to a professional, that's step two professional editor, then send it to a line editor. How does this flow? Then send it to a proofreader. A proofreader should probably be almost that last step before you send it to the printer to make sure no more typos, no more spilling er errors. When this book came out, I was speaking, uh, it's the next exit up at uh, the Bronner Brothers Business Institute as a keynote speaker. And even as I sold her, I said, if you guys see a typo or, ed or a um, grammatical error, let me know and I'll give you a prize. So I had my readers editing, like it gets so many edits. So I would start with that editing process, especially with a fiction book to make sure your story flows. Cause right now it probably sounds good in your head, right? Now you got to get it into the hands. But when you look for an editor, one thing I teach my clients is to look for someone with experience editing the type of book that you have written. 
and they may even represent the type of audience that you wrote the book for. For example, I write for women entrepreneurs, so my editor is a woman in business here in Atlanta. Um, a great place to start is a site like Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R dot com. For $5 starting at, you can get people to start editing and proofing your book chapter by chapter. And that's what my editor does. As I write a chapter, I send it. Write a chapter, send it. And it's with different editors at the same time. So for five bucks, you know, it's unlimited. So hopefully that helped you to know where to start. Five Make sure they, chapter. yeah, well it's five bucks per, you can talk to them about what they charge, but it starts at five bucks. Um, my 10th book has 10 chapters, so I was feeling generous and I paid her 10 bucks a chapter just to edit it. But chapters have different uh, pages, you know, pages. Pages, different amount of words, um, different titles, so you have to, that's why I say get an editor who's familiar with the type of book you're writing so they can tell you, okay, this is good for chapter one and making sure it flows into chapter two and so on. Make sure they're good at fiction and let them know you want to go chapter by chapter versus 300 pages at one time and then you get all these red marks back, you know? So, I do, and the website I use, one of them is called Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R dot com. That's the five dollars and up. And if you want me to write it down for you, I can. I can share more with you. Okay. Any other questions? Yes. So when you've gone through that process of editor one, line reader, proofreader, <laughs> second reader, fourth reader, and tenth reader, uh -huh. how do you now push it to the next level of actually getting it to print? So then you want to do what's called a focus group. That's what I did with this book. I sent it to two ladies who represent the type of women that I would sell this book to. And I let them read it and give me feedback. And I have a word in here that a lot of people don't use and they feel like it's unladylike. It's like it starts with an F. It's not a curse word. But one of my readers, she's a good friend here in Atlanta, she sent it back and she said, AJ, I would take that word out. And that helped me. I didn't take it out because I was making a point in the book. Now y'all want to know what it is, don't you? You got to buy the book. I have five copies. They're only 15 bucks. <laughs> so in the book, I was able to um, have uh, proofreaders and, in the form of my focus group, and they gave feedback. Well, in the top of my page, I used what they said as uh, testimonials. This is what they said. So you need testimonials for your book. Some people put them on the back. And then go back to a site like Fiverr and look for someone who can format your manuscript. Because now you have a proofread, edited manuscript with, the publish, uh, with a focus group. Get help with formatting for online platforms like Kindle, Amazon's Kindle service. So there's a lady, I think she's in the Soviet Union. She was editing this while I was asleep. And when I woke up, it was formatted perfectly. Um, with hyperlinks, meaning if you look at a chapter number, you want to click it and it takes you right to the chapter in the digital formatted book. And then they do what's called formatting for uh, EPUB. The format is called EPUB. I don't speak that language. She spoke it. I paid her $5 and she laid out all 126 pages. And then the, the next step is uploading it to a platform like CreateSpace, which ties into Amazon and Kindle. CreateSpace prints my book. This book may have been $2 to print and ship. And of course, $15 is what I sell it for, so it's a little bit of a profit. Um, and after that, you just keep ordering. But that's the freedom you have as a self-published author. If you have a traditional publisher, you would usually go through them to get them to send you several copies. They're gonna sell your book back to you. But as a self-published author, you can go and order as many copies as you like. So I've sold about 250 copies of this book, brought in about 13,000, just based on that simple publishing process. Um, I, I read somewhere, uh, where it is stated that, like for example, Kindle with, with Amazon, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, now they may say, for example, the price of your book is, well, they, they the price is $14, and then somebody orders the book. Mm -hmm. Now, they ship the book to you, uh, to the person, mm -hmm. and you probably get only about $5 in return. It depends on how you have it set up. Um, Amazon usually takes, I think it's 35%, if I'm not mistaken, but that's just the digital copy. So you got to look at this. This book is, this is print, then there's the online, which Amazon helps me sell, and then there's the audio, and then workbooks, and then workshops. So with so many others that that little percentage, let them keep it because they help you sell your book. Um, and so, yeah, you don't want to have that as your only uh, revenue stream for your book. So yes, they'll sell it for a percentage on Amazon. But what I love is when just surprise deposits show up because they've been selling my book and I've been, you know, focusing on the print copies and things like that. 
yeah but that's just one stream you can also sell it on your website and do like I do keep copying your trunk you know <laughs> so there are ways to get it out there so yeah they will help you sell it but that's also going to be an agreement that you work out with like bookstores and things like that so people can go and purchase your book when you're not there so yeah give up a percentage you know you got a soul to read right <laughs> Good. I Did I see? Uh -huh. what, what impact does social media have in, in publishing and in selling your books? Social media has a lot of impact. My 10th book is called Messaging Magic, How to Convert Conversations to Clients, Cash, Checks, and Credit Cards. Mm -hmm. And I let my audience on social media, specifically Facebook, vote on what my cover should be. Um, and then offer the opportunity for people to give feedback and be in my next focus group telling me how this book has impacted them. And then next week at my writer's retreat, all of my attendees get a copy of the book and they're going to share it with their social media networks and, as well. So it has a big impact, but you have to have a strategy. How am I going to use this to accomplish what I want to accomplish? So I told you guys, book number 10, Messaging Magic, is a six-figure book. And uh, I was coached on that at a book retreat this time last year, live on social media, so everybody saw the coach getting coached, but it brought me to where I know what to do now to make that amount of money. And social media has impacted that and has helped. Um, I did about 90 days on social media, back to back to back, promoting books and events I'll be speaking at. So again, you just have to have a strategy for how that falls into what you're planning on doing with your book. You may not be trying to make $100,000. You may just want to sell a couple copies. But social media can greatly impact it if you know what you want to do and have a plan. And so to attend one of your classes, how much is it? So the event I'm hosting next week is called Right Now. It's 2018. Uh, right Now 2018. It's our second year here in Douglasville. It's $297 to sit in the boardroom with me and five ladies who are also working on their books. Get my, my brain on your book for 10 hours. So I have two spots available for that and some sponsorship opportunities. If you have a book and you want uh, my social media follow of about 12,000 people to see who you are because I'll interview you live on Facebook social media that's part of the plan then I help you uh, get that type of exposure as well so 297 for right now it's one week from today we'll be right down the street all day writing your book yes how do you go about trying to get the maximum um, exposure a focus group of, of, of your book the best thing I did was go down to the local chamber of commerce and they have a wall full of business cards and I took about 200 of those cards and because I work with women, these women were in business because they're members at the chamber. If they had a woman's name on that card, I took that card home with me and I emailed the woman directly saying, hey, my name is AJ, I'm new to the business community. Um, I would love to know what you're working on in your business. And those women were the ones who gave me the struggles to put in the book. And then I put the book on my website. A lady bought it before I had even written it and she's right here in Atlanta. We met for coffee and she told me everything she wanted me to say in this book. So that's how my focus group came about because I started reaching out to women who represented the audience that I was writing for. So that's very important as you write and as you sell, think about who that book is for and that's how you get it in their hands. They come on board and support you any way you need them. Yeah, yes. Do you remember many other professional organizations other than Great question. I'm not even a member here. <laughs> One of my clients referred me. Hey, Juanita. Um, at the moment, the only association I am a member of is uh, my local co work space because they too are attached to women like Jessica who have office spaces within the community. And I can reach out and invite them to events and connect with them and network and things like that. But I go to different events, mostly only if I'm speaking. So I get random calls, you know, to come speak and I'm not necessarily uh, a member. Yeah, but it is important. So that's a great question though. Mm -hmm. Great question. Alumni association or anything? Not yet, no. Mm -mm. Yes. Now, uh, there's a gentleman uh, that I, I met or, you know, I got in touch with on uh, social media. His name is Wesley mm -hmm. Virgin. Now he's about 32 years old and he wrote something about um, with, I mean, build exercise and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And he's now a millionaire. He claims mm -hmm. a millionaire. Is that what it's about? $30 million? That's what he said. Yeah. <laughs> and he shows it also, you know, where he lives, in the cars he drives, he drives. Mm -hmm. like now he emphasized the need to advertise on social media based on on, on a daily basis yes now in the process of advertising do you I mean of course I know you do your videos on YouTube as well as 
uh, on Facebook. Mm -hmm. Now, do you put this information on a daily basis you know, for you to be, you know, seen? So you do, say, for example, you do a video today. Mm -hmm. You have to do another video tomorrow. Mm -hmm. so you do that you do today. You use it for the next day. Yeah, so first there is the difference between marketing and advertising. So he may be talking about the advertising that you buy, like when you're scrolling Facebook and someone's sponsored ad pops up. I'm not into that yet. That's techie and I'm looking for someone to hire to do that for me. But I do market, meaning I'm in someone's face every day telling them I have a book and I have a business and I want to help you tell me what you need. Okay. And so what I do is called batching. That means I sit in my office for one day, maybe about two hours, and I film about 10 videos back to back to back. So that when I'm laying in bed one night and I want to post a video, they're already done. I had my hair done and my makeup and my earrings on and I look like, yeah, she's in the studio now. But I've already batched that and filmed that, you know, days before. So that's how I show up every day, kind of pre-planning. But again, it goes back to what's your social media plan? What's your social media strategy? How do you want to show up, you know, to the people who need your book, need to hear your story? That's how I do it. Yes. One final question before I go. Anybody? Any question about the book, how we can work together, my event next week, being a sponsor for the event, self-publishing, traditional publishing, anything that I can answer before I wrap up. Raise your hand if you want a copy of the book. It's, I have five uh, copies for $15. Five copies for fifteen dollars. Yes. Getting a discount for coming here. That is the discount for coming here. <laughs> Who had a question? I saw a hand. Do you, you help market anybody's book? Say it again slowly. You help market somebody's book? Absolutely. I have a book marketing program. It's 21 days. I actually printed it out for you guys and left it on my desk this morning. But I do have a program available to help you market your book successfully. Um, and it has helped my clients bring in their first $500 off of their book and um, make sure that you know where to show up. Like I mentioned, TV, social media, podcasts, interviews, newspapers, all of that based on what I've done successfully for the 13,000 that this brought in. So yes, I'll be happy to talk with you more about that. All right, guys, well, thank you so much for allowing me this platform to be in front of you today. I want you to remember there's someone somewhere waiting on you to walk in your destiny so they can walk into theirs because it's when you let your light shine, you give others permission to do the same. I'm AJ Austin. This is my table here. I'm happy to chat with you. Thank you to the association for having me today. God bless. Thank you. It's my pleasure to announce the presence of um, Fidelis Are. Fidelis, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's nice to have you here. And also my pleasure to introduce the MC, Dr. Tessalinda Agozier. Welcome, Tessie. Yes. Please come. Somebody just walk in. Um, Permit me. Mm -hmm. You're welcome, sir. Just can I get your name, please? Godwin Ananaba. Godwin Ananaba. Yes. You're welcome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please, I also want to re re recognize the presence of um, mm -hmm. Mr. Godwin Ananaba. Dr. Godwin Ananaba. Oh, Dr. Godwin Ananaba. You're welcome, sir. Nice to have you. So, we'll just go through this presentation now, and after this, we'll have the individual authors present their books. Yeah, for the sake of time, we're going to um, end here and we will invite um, Dr. Chinedu to brief us on what happened from here. You know, this actually, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Um, my name is um, Dr. Pastor Tessie Aguzi. Originally, I'm a Nigerian and I'm one of those Nigerians that had it so sweet growing up. But with inner determination, we make a decision that we're not going to stop where we find ourselves. When I say that, it sounds so funny because um, when I put my swag on, people don't really see where I started. Do you get what I mean? I said when I put my swag on, people don't see where I start. So I was born in Aba, in Abia State, Nigeria. And a lot of us in the house, two bedroom. One room, one parlor. And, you know, but we had the best of life and everything. So as God may have it, as I ended up 
hawking oranges, selling things in the street because there was no money to go to school. But as God may have it, I love to go to school. You know, sometimes we have to hide ourselves during the morning section so that people don't know we don't go to school. So in the afternoon when everybody is out, then we come out and just play along. So it looks like we actually did. So, but because they do go to school, I loved it. I want to, but it didn't come. There was no money. You know what, we resolved to what is available, hawking with our mom, going to buy things and, but inner strength, somebody say inner strength. Inner strength. I said to myself, I will go to school and I'm gonna study till the end of education. This is the little girl just speaking what she sees. As God may have it, started hawking, doing all the orange and stuff, took a lot of pictures, so I have evidence of everything. As though I know that life is gonna change for better. And to cut the story short, um, I'm born motivator, you know, because my life was tough. But today, I didn't just start school, but I have PhD, and I'm going for a second PhD. And this is not just being an orange girl in Africa. I did my first degree in Nigeria, I did my master's in Europe, I did my doctorate in America, I travel around the world. I'm a motivational speaker, so I go to different places. What do I tell them? If I can do it, you can do it. Just like she's saying, left brain and right brain. There's none that is wrong. All of them are just well packaged by the creator of the universe. So the way he made you, you fit. You are perfect. The thing is just for you to understand who you are. If the left is not working for you, use the right. If the right is not working for you, do the two. If both of them refuse to do, do it, just dance your way through life. Mm -hmm. Everything works. If you look at the right brainers, the ones they think that they have low IQ and all that, those people are the ones who are actually producing a lot. The musician, the artist, all these people you see all over the place creating, being creative are those ones that their brain is not really doing stuff. But the ones that are left side, they have IQ, doctorate, PhD. I don't know where I belong because I dance and I perform and still do <laughs> IQ stuff. So the thing is that don't just limit yourself based on what study shows you. You understand? Um, I will, when my time comes to introduce my book, I will talk about it because I've authored four different books. Even though I was one of the right brainers and then developed my left brain on my own, you can do anything you want by yourself and the sweet thing is that there's no time that is too late if you start today you're gonna make things work for yourself today so if you have kids and you they look as though they are not doing well don't lose your faith just speak faith into them I'm gonna tell you a little bit about subconscious mind when it's time how you can impact their life and make things work for you so if that being said where is Uncle Chine do is he out Okay, so um, he's supposed to like give us the highlights of what happened. This was from last year, the first time. We had a nice time, and I know by the time the next year comes, we, we're gonna have a better time together. So um, it was a powerful presentation. So um, I think um, Uncle Chile Du will give us the, the lowdown of what happened, why we're moving to the rest of the things. I'm sorry. So let's clap our hand and welcome him. Thank you. Uh, actually, what happened is uh, that was our inaugural uh, book exhibition last year, uh, November 4th, 2017. And uh, her topic, she's our member, and uh, she's not here today. That's why we are presenting this uh, video, uh, because she's a little bit ill, and uh, we wish her uh, a very quick recovery. So what she's doing here is what she did was give a very analyzed uh, and detailed uh, information about the brain functions which is on the program too you're going to see the program when the magazine is uh, handed over to you and uh, the most important thing is that you can follow up uh, to get this, the, the, the information is on a small pamphlet if you're interested for those family members, I mean, children and uh, teachers and everything, you can order for that uh, her booklet through our website, www.iaaauthors.org, which you can always ask one of us about it. So that's the follow-up I want to make about her presentation. 
Professor Hanotu's presentation and uh, follow up uh, if you want more copies of that to our the associations, International Association of African Authors and Scholars website, and then you can actually get information about that book. And not just her book, but all our members, their books are listed there in, on our website. And uh, as I said earlier, by, from next year, we'll start selling our authors' books from that website so that our authors can benefit from this association. Thank you. Thank you. Let me borrow this a little sure. bit. Mm -hmm. So to continue on what we have the next, I want to just talk briefly about this bulletin. Um, it contains a lot of things about this association, if you really want to know more. Um, it, right, right now, you know, when something is in this inception stage, it looks as though it's not going to fly. But I want you to understand that when we put our effort, it doesn't matter how many people, this association will fly, not just run, fly, and just, you know, excel, because this is what we need to move to the next level. You know, anywhere that you have people who can write, think, and just from experience put it together so that people who come later can just look at it and see you know what happened with those people they will learn from our own personal experience so uh, with that being said we want everybody to participate to support us is our um, free will donation uncle we welcome you um we're happy that you are here so um, i will have someone from the back to you know give you special tour of, about the the, the um, magazines and I was talking to our friend here from Cameroon, it's awesome. So um, we need to go through it and then see how we can support the organization. Um, we, the funds from there help us to foot bills and some payments and other things that we need to do with the organization. So um, I will talk more about that later. But now uh, we want to invite all the authors that are present here today so that they can tell you brief story about what really you know what their book is all about what happened why did you start writing and what is this book what the, what is the content of your book so based on that every other person will know um why we are here and if you have not written anything it's time for you to just sit up and put things down Everybody have experience. You may think that it's very irrelevant, but until you hear about another person's life, you know that if you would have, you know, tell the person what you went through and how you did come out of it, you would have saved a lot of lives. So um, I'm gonna invite the first person, um, Sunday Joseph Oteo. God bless you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I know we've been sitting for a long time and feeling a little tired and some of us have not eaten lunch yet. Uh, but why, why eat lunch now? We have eaten for so many years. Uh, we can eat in the evening. But my name is uh, Sunday Joseph Otengo. Now my last name is abbreviated for the microwave people in America because uh, where I come from, Sunday is, is an unnamed from uh, uh, the fact that I was born on a Sunday. Uh, then to become human, uh, my parents had given me Joseph, so I'd become, my soul would become accepted before God, you know, and then of course Otengo, but when you come back home, they call me Otengo Balakachalo Amumbe, and that means Otengo, the conquering son of the creating one. And so I, I accept that, I have my identity well, well, well formed if I came here, and when I came here, the first thing they told me that I was black. So how could you take all this identity of mine? Uh, I was an I, I was an Otengo. I was a, 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 a Lundu by clan, a Luya by ethnic group, and a Bantu, of course, by by by, by race. And all that when I land in America is only given to me by what? Being called black. I say, what's your problem? I'm already identified, I have my roots. And so I've been fighting that for quite a long time since I've been here in the US. But I, I was born in Kenya and raised up in Uganda uh, and spent most of my time in Tanzania. So I'm a true East African. But my desire in my life has been from childhood 
My father, my father was uh, one of the first surgeons on the continent of Africa. He had his first surgeon doctorate back in 1959. And my mother was a member of parliament, born in Kenya, remember? My, pap, my papa died, and therefore my mother remarried in Uganda. So moved to Uganda, my mother became a member of parliament under the first regime in Uganda. And I remember 1961, uh, we were sitting uh, in the evening with my father uh, in, in, in a room with a tiny little console TV, black and white, you know, that little box. And my father was watching and there was a man who was being pulled in his, uh, with, uh, tied behind, behind a truck in the street of Kinshasa, being dragged across the street, and that was Patrice Lumumba, oh. being killed. And for the first time I saw my father cry. And when my father said crying, I said, why are you crying? And I heard him say, there goes the liberation of our people. Africa is dead. And that at, at, the age of, uh, at the age of eight, that imprinted in my mind, like you have never known to this day. So for this day, I've been fighting for the, for the unit of Africa. That Africa would become one because we are a people that have, that have really held this world together. Yes. And we have in, in, in all the, 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 the poverty and every lack of good government or what have you, have come out people that are so beautiful, people that are so resilient, yes. people so are determined. Like my sister was, was sharing, why would she even have a PhD and going for the second one? Having grown up that way, hawking on the streets. I have a little daughter I just adopted about eight months ago. She was born on the streets of Nairobi. Her mother was homeless. At four, she was diagnosed with, with cancer, or with, with a heart problem. She went in hospital at four years old, was in hospital, and the medical doctors, from, emotional from, 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 from London, came and, and, and started treating her, and then started teaching her how to write. She just turned 11, and she has written three books and published them from the streets. Okay, and uh, uh, she's right now today in South Africa receiving an award uh, called the, 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 uh, the Africa Child of the Year. Uh, coming from very meager, we have brains and we have the understanding and we have the determination and we have to tell our story. If we don't tell our story, nobody will. So I came, I have been, I've, I've, had, about, I've had about nine manuscripts sitting on the, on the shelving. And for a long time I wanted to publish, but I had so many ideas going over and over the place, I couldn't do anything. So finally this little girl came into my life eight years ago, I mean eight months ago. And she gave me her first book and said, Daddy, when I come in, uh, in, in October, you better have published this book. And so I started scrambling because I, I, she told me this in May. I started scrambling and got my book, of, I mean, my, one of my manuscripts off the shelves. And there it came, the heart of my life. Uh, I just find Swahili as the national language of United Africa, knowing that we have 2,000 languages and we have those that are borrowed. But we have languages that are being taught even in Kenya as a teach Kiswahili, teach it as a language not as a value-centered uh, 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 book or, or subject that allows our values and traditions of our people to be passed on from generation to generation. So this book came and uh, self-published. I spent a lot of hours on it uh, between May and July and, and June and August so that my daughter came last month in October. She came here. I, she was uh, very happy to give her a copy. And this is why I have written it. It just simply just fight Swahili as the final, as the language of Africa. I went to school in many, many places. I have two PhDs, and I'm not going for the third one because there are no people in, in the grave. So, but God bless you, and I'm so happy to be among you. Yeah. Um I didn't remind you I'm a pastor. Because I'm a pastor, everything is amen. amen. Yes, so if you don't say amen, I'll charge you money. <laughs> so when we finish any sentence, you better say amen. I'm still seeing some people didn't hear me. Do you go to church at all? Even if you don't go to church, it's okay. But it's okay, say amen. Good. 
Um, another thing I like so much, apart from schooling and doing something good, I like food. I don't know if anybody here like food, but me, I do. <laughs> so if you are telling me anything, no matter how much how my left brain is working, or my right brain, if you don't give me food, both of them will stop working. That's the truth. So having said that, it's time to go and find something behind us and put it in our mouth. Why well, we'll continue with the rest of the program. So um, lunch time has passed. So we have something. We're ready, right? So I want everybody to please. If you don't want, it's OK. You can look cute. I'm going to take care of my left and right brain. So let's go over there and get something to eat. God bless you. Say amen. amen. Good. Dr. Jimofo, it's your turn. OK. Good afternoon, everybody. <coughs> My name is Cornelius Ejemofo. My daughter is passing some thing around. I didn't expect to speak in front of the audience. So I wrote something, you can look at that. I'm a retired college professor with 40 years of graduate and undergraduate college education. I was at the University of Nigeria for 12 years, and the other 28 in 30 different universities here in the United States. I thought I was going back to Nigeria after getting my master's in 1967 to work for the government, but because of the Biafra war, I couldn't get back, so I had to continue. My biography is listed in Marquis Susu for several years. And last year, they gave me an award. To look at the last paragraph there. Albert Nelson Marquis Susu Lifetime Achievement Program representing outstanding professional dedication and career longevity, 40 years. My area is administration, public administration. Well, sometimes we talk of management. Some people write, they call it personnel management, some call it public management, but I chose human resources, management of human resources, to include management both in the public sector, in the private sector, and the public-private sector areas. It took me, <laughs> some, the first speaker spoke about a year or so for writing the book, but I can talk about 10 years of collecting these materials. These are materials, <clears throat> lectures I gave in public administration, administrative theories, management, and the American government too. So I chose the area, human resources, because this is important in every organization. If a nation cannot manage its public, its people, it cannot manage anything else. It's very important in any organization for the people, both the workers and the employers, to benefit from whatever they are doing. For instance, they're talking about taxes now and the Democrats are being accused of Um, em 
emphasizing on taxes for the rich, I mean, gains for the rich. And they would want gains for the poor as well, so that it would benefit everybody. So I started this with indicating the processes that are necessary in the employment relations between managers and employers. I started with why it is necessary to benefit in any organization you are in, whether you are the employer or the employee. Where that is the case, everybody is happy and there is success. So I started with how to advertise and employ people, what is necessary, what the law requires. Then I went to how to hire people, how to train them, how to discipline them. how to organize them, how to um, how to assess their work, how to promote them, how to demote them, and the implications of all these approaches. Then retirement, eventually. <coughs> I didn't plan to talk here, uh, but I wanted you to know that it took me time to put this together. It's, it's just like taking lectures in different courses that I taught that are related to human relations, management of human resources. Actually, it took me three years to put these things together after finishing my career. It took me three years to put these things together, but I had to look at all my notes. You know, teachers make notes. And uh, some of us from Nigeria here, we use a lot of notes. And so I had to expand these, look at them, recite them, and put them together. That's the matter what you talk about. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So the next person is um, Ms. Sally Ekom. Hello, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah, my name is Sally Ekom. My full name is Sally Sherifat Eko. I'm originally from Oshogbo, Nigeria. But when my parents had me, they migrated to Ghana. So I grew up in Ghana. Then from Ghana, I came here to study in the, in the 70s. I went to the University of Illinois. When I graduated, I went to Nigeria from, you know, so I, from Ghana to, use, to back to Nigeria. And I read finance from the University of Illinois. I got a green in, first degree in finance, Bachelor of Science in Finance. Then I went home. I went with UBA for almost 18 years. Then when I was say I met my, you know, my partner. We had a child and, you know, I, brought, I took her home with me when she grew up. She said, Mommy, I'm going back to U.S. I said, ah, why U.S.? We are doing well. I'm working in a bank. Your father has said, I'm going to buy. If you don't come with me, I'm going by myself. So I said, ah, you're not going. So I came back to U.S. again, 19, 2001, to be with my kids. So I'm here. And uh, like I said, you know, you know, back home in Africa, we are the people. We, we have dignity. We have respect. But the moment you leave Africa and go to another place, they see you as somebody else. So when I came here, you know, like, I'm an educated woman, I'm, I'm a human being. But they make you feel like you are different, as if you, you, you are not a part of the human race. So I kept wondering, you know, when I was a student, it was different. Illinois, maybe, I don't know, but, you know, maybe because I was young, I didn't see any discrimination. They, you know, I felt like I'm a human being, too. You know, I, I, my, my roommate was white. I, the school I went in is basically white. We were a few black people there. I didn't see any difference. 
But coming back again in 2001, people make you feel different, as if you know the black race is you know another species of human being. So then I, you know, I started thinking. I said, ah. so I went back. Then I remember that you know, if you go back to history, we were doing very well. The black race was on top of the world. People used to come to Africa and visit. We had gold. People would try. We have the Mali Empire, the Songa Empire, the Ghana Empire. So they heard about us the way we spend money in Africa. So the you know the gold you know like the, 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 the gold market in Egypt was where everybody was coming. So it was when they came to Africa, and by that time they had problem. This bubonic fever, which killed a lot of Europeans, they have this disease which was killing them. People were just dying. The people were even saying the old people were saying, okay, let the kids eat and me, let me die. So it was so terrible in Europe in the 13th century, and this time Africa was doing very well. So when they saw us, like, you know, we, they are dying and we are like this, then they realized that we had farms, people were farming, we live in villages, we have kings and kings. So they now came to Africa, and like I said, we are very receptive, we are more compassionate, we like people. A black man will welcome anybody, we don't discriminate. So when they came, we welcomed them very well, not knowing they had their own intentions. So they came with a pretense of religion, and before we know, they were taking us overseas, and that began the slave trade. And when they brought us here to, they realized we were stronger, we could work better than the people they met here, the natives. So they, they, they now, then the slave trade now became a business. They were coming to Africa to bring us. But notwithstanding, the black who were brought here didn't just start and say, I'm, I'm content being slave. They fought. Some will run away. They do so many things to get themselves free. Because some were maybe kings and you know, princesses in Africa. And when they brought them here, they didn't like the slavery. So they ran away, they did everything. Then later on, they said, okay, since Africa is so far away, we have to settle. So they settled and they were planning. But God being kind, he put some people, you know, the, the, uh, 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 the let me just escape me now, in, 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 in England, that, you know, slavery should not be accepted because it's against the English custom for slavery to be in the society. So they now start fighting for the slavery. They were, you know, helping the slaves. Yeah. So I realized, exactly. William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce, exactly. This William Wilberforce, you know, now talk about the slavery. So they started stopping slavery. They came to America to say the same thing. So I realized that even now in the modern world, the world depends on Africa. If you look at your computers, the chips and everything is from Africa. The coffee they drink is in Africa. Chocolate is in Africa. The clothes we wear, the cotton they use is from Africa. And now when they turn around and say, Africa is poor, I look at myself, are you poor? No, I'm not poor. Are you poor? None of Africa is never poor. We are not poor. It's just a label to make them feel better. When they do any statistics, everything is Africa. The poorest person in Africa, believe me, the poorest person is in America here. In America, Africa, nobody stayed on the street. We have homes. If I go to a show where I say I'm from this home, people know where I come from. We all have homes. So I decided that I'm going to write a book titled Being Black No Much Has Changed. Then now and the way forward. Because they still see us the way they saw us in the 13th century. They don't see any difference in us. But we know there are differences. So I want us, as I talk about every country in Africa, from Ghana to Nigeria to South, I talk about everybody. The resources we have. Why can't we, like people who grow cocoa, join together and form some partnership? So that we have it, like the Opel, the, the, the petrol, you know they have this OPEC. So OPEC is, is a control. People growing cocoa in all these African countries, they should, they should form a cartel and decide how they sell their products. People selling uh, all these minerals, they should form cartel so that we can be strong. Because if we continue this way, Africa will not go forward. You know the price they sell cocoa was sent, in, the price of cocoa was set in the 18th century. It doesn't matter what happened, it's still the same prices. Whether there's demand, it's the same thing. That's why Nestle is making money and Africa is poor. So we have to, as a people, do something to move Africa forward. And when you look at America, they talk about individualism. It's not individualism. The stock market is nothing but communal people putting money together. You can't do anything alone. We have to begin to form you know, stock market associations. You know, if somebody wants to do something, bring people together. That, OK, contribute this, contribute this. When we sell it, we share the profit. That's what the Western world, what it is. They contribute resources to move forward. 
But Africans, we want to do things on our own. We can never get anywhere. It's together, they say, if you put a broom, if you take a stick or broom and you break it, it does what it breaks. But if you put them together and you tie them, it will be difficult to break them. So Africa should unite. We have to come together as a people. We are not blacks, we are human beings, just like everybody else. And it's the same sky, the same soil. If you are in Africa, you see the same sky we, we are looking at now. Then why are we different? We are not black because we are inferior. It's the environment. It's so sunny. God is so, in his merciful power, he gave us this, this skin. It's nothing but melanin to protect us from what? From the sun. That's why we are black. We are not black because we are stupid. No. He, he protects us from what? From the, from, from the sun rays. That's why we are black. So if I'm, I don't care who you are, I see myself as what? As a human being, just like anybody else. So we should not let people to tell us that because we are black, we are inferior. No. We have what it takes, and we are survivors. They came here, they built universities, they built university, Kentucky University. They built schools. Even right now that I'm talking, they call black people lazy. They are not lazy. Go to anywhere, go to McDonald's, go to Walmart, go anywhere. Who do you see working? You hardly see a white person working anywhere. You can find them in the shop mall in shopping. But you, have, you find black people working in the offices everywhere. Cleaners, McDonald's, the airport. It's black people working. Are we lazy? Then why are we not developing Africa? Why are we not developing our own continent? That's our own. If Africa is well developed, we only come here to visit and go back. But when we come here, we do what? We sit put because we think Africa has no place to be. It's in our hands. We have to develop Africa because it's a great country and we are great people. That's what this book is all about. It's about us. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. My name is Obi Awuchi. Okwama. Um, in my book, I put Obi Okwama. Actually, I said Obi Awuchi, and my daughter didn't even know my full name is Obi Awuchi. <laughs> Could I, no, that's what my, my, my mother and my grandmother used to call me when I was small. Obi Awuchi, the complete name. So, um, I wrote this book because I'm passionate about it. As I was growing up during the war. I was in elementary school trying to finish elementary. The war started. I was still young. And I, ex I experienced it full time. My father was uh, an administrator for the kids who, were, who are dying every day, trying to give them food. Um, the case for Biafra restoration with Biafra Africa rises. Some people, when you use that word Biafra, they get scared. But look at what is happening to Nigeria today. Look at, how, look at where we are as a country. We create a country because we have value system. Not, it's not how big we are. It is how efficient you can work. We want African unity. That's fine as a, as a continent. But as a nation, you need to have a, a common value system for this to work. In, in, in 1999 constitution, Nigerian constitution, for example, you people know that we have the Muslims in the north and we have predominantly Christians in the south. And 1999 constitution, what does it say? It was almost an is Islamic constitution. Islam was mentioned about 46 times. 
other languages in Islam was mentioned in the constitution, but there was no single mention of Christ or Christianity in Nigerian constitution. Some of you don't know that. Go and find out. There was never a mention of Christianity or Christ in the Nigerian 1999 constitution they are using today. In 1986, Abraham Babangida withdrew about 20 billion pounds, not, not Naira, to go and register Nigeria as an Islamic nation. Do you, do you people even know that we are, Nigeria is an Islamic country? No. You don't know that. So, what we are experiencing today is an experiment. We don't want to Islamize the entire country. But some people don't believe it. But, uh, some, some have seen tomorrow. Some people don't believe it. But it's happening now. As the government are adding the herdsmen to kill people every single day. 200 were killed last, last, last week in Benue. 200 human beings. And the president didn't say a word. And we're in one country. So what we are saying, what we are saying here, everybody, please have a copy of my book because something is going to happen very soon. We are, are demanding for a referendum. We, are not, we don't want to go to war. A referendum is not asking for war. A referendum is when people come together and want to vote whether they want to remain in this country or they want to stay. It's as simple as that. But when, you, when we call for a referendum, they, they know they're not saying we are calling for, for, for war. It's, no, the referendum is done all over the world. It's enshrined in the United Nations Charter. Okay? So, Ambas, um, Ambazonians in, the, um, in, 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 in Cameroon are having the same, the same problem. Because in, in, in 1914, the British government came to Nigeria and put the in our southern and the northern uh, protectorate, they call it protectorates, northern and southern protectorate, and put them together southern and say, protectorates, and, uh -huh, and put them together and call them what? Nigeria. Niger area, that is where the river flow and the area it flows, it's flowed from. That's the meaning of Nigeria. Okay. So right now, we don't even have a country. We have a president, we don't even know if the, the current president is what is really uh, uh, Buhari or whether Buhari is dead. We don't know that as we speak. Some people think he's dead. He died uh, about, about uh, last year and he was quietly buried in Saudi Arabia. So we are debating now online whether, whether he has a, a certificate or not. That is what is happening now. This is a factual, fact-finding book. It is, we have our right for our own opinion. But you don't have right for fact. Fact is a fact. Truth is a truth. So regardless of how people look at it, we have to speak the truth. And the truth will set us free. Thank you. Thank you all. I told them that I don't know how to do MC because whenever I'm not smiling, my face looks so mean. <laughs> Is it compulsive that pastor smile? <laughs> yeah, even though sometimes I forget myself and my son with mommy. <laughs> you 
<laughs> yeah, the truth is, when I was very small, I hate something about myself, my cheekbones. Yeah, because they call me a bunty. I don't know if you know what it means, but it means big cheeks. So, truth, I had very low self-esteem when I was growing up. I never look at people's faces. Why? Because when you look at me and smile, in my mind I say, mm-hmm, you're talking about my cheeks. So, with, because of that, I don't look at people. So that really affected me. You know, in America, we go through bullying. I don't know about if you're dealing with young people, you will know that is a big thing, bullying. And every week I get young ones that want to kill themselves in my church. Constantly, I have to go to the house, preach, dance, speak, for them to understand that they are looking so good because they are fearfully made by God. I, ha I don't know why God had to allow me to go through that, but now I know because you can't tell people what you have not experienced. So whatever I'm telling you today is not just far-fetched, it's what I have tested and confirmed that it worked. So as God may have it, I realize now that I have the most beautiful chicks in the whole world. Yes. <laughs> and I like to flaunt it. How did that happen? Whatever you say, that's what you get. Um, I told you how, where I was born in Abba and what happened to me while growing up. I didn't have a chance based on the status quo. But inside me, I know that something can be done, but I don't know how. And I begin to visualize my future. I begin to talk about my future. You know, people say you boast. Myself, I call myself braggadocious by nature. I tell you what I want to have, and I speak as though I have it. So as God may have that, that changed my life and destiny. And I was able to do my orange, sell my, um, the fruits, get to Futo Federal University of Technology or where when I graduated, I was telling them that you guys will still be looking for job when I'll be driving my Jeep. You know, SUV is called Jeep. So I said, I'll be driving my Jeep when you're still carrying your file and I will have several of them. And I'm going to travel to several countries of this world and I'm going to school to the end of education. And I'm going to do, I am, I keep saying, saying, saying that people think, what is, we know that you're my father is selling bottles, and true, that's what my father is selling, and my mom is selling vegetable. So where will all this thing come from? Knowing where you were born, you guys still cook with firewood, even in township, and it's so true. So where are you going to get all these things? But a man with a dream is like a madman. Nobody understands you, just yourself. But when you finally land, then people will know that you were not mad. You were just using your left and right brain. So when I um, graduated in Nigeria, tried to look for a job as usual, you know. <laughs> it was beautiful that anywhere I apply, I couldn't get any job. And some people want to, you know, test, have the kind of knowledge of you for them to, you know, give you a job. But I said, that's not what I went to school to do. Instead, let me resolve back to what I used to do, selling. Why am I saying this? Whatever or wherever you find yourself, there's a reason. Take advantage of that. It may not look good now, but take advantage of it because everywhere in your life, there's a lesson. If you can learn that lesson, you can go to the next class. Remember, before you pass just one, you have to write test to go to just two. If you don't pass it, you're going to repeat it over and over. And that's why we are stuck in several things over and over. So in my own case, my life started as selling, hawking. But when I graduated, there was nothing to do. I went back to selling fairly used clothes. Then I migrated to Lagos thinking it's going to be nice, but couldn't get a job. So I started buying three store clothing, which we call OK or Krika. Yeah, and um, I was buying shoes, and I love shoes. So um, actually, it's a lot of prayer and seeking God and all that. And I had audible voice that said, do something and I'll bless it. For those of us who give tithe and offering in church and you don't do anything, expecting manna from sky, it's not going to happen. You give, but do something so that God will bless it based on whatever you're doing. Through that, you'll be blessed. So when I did something, what is it? Buying and selling that I learned as a little girl. I started buying OK shoes and I started taking it to all those big shops and companies in Lagos and God promised me if you do something I'll bless it and in three months 
I was able to get money, paid my school fees, paid everything in Europe, and I traveled for my master's. Nobody brought me God single-handedly, sent me there. So when I graduated there with first class, they were sending students to different countries for training, and they sent me to Chateau Elan in Atlanta for my training one year. So when I came here, I said, I'm not going again. Mm -hmm. So that's how I stayed. So that having been said, I've authored four books. Actually, this one, the first one is called Your Destiny is in Your Hands. Why? Because I took my destiny and run. God is always ready to support anybody that wants to do something. So um, instead of me to blame my father, blame my mother, one day I told my mother, everybody's running to America to have their baby so they can be citizens. Why did you run to Abba? You shouldn't have run to Abba. You should have run to a better place. But you know what? The things I learned from Abba is actually what made me who I am today. So I'm proud of my Abba brought up. Say hallelujah. Amen. Any Abba person here? Very few. So amen. Amen. Good. Thank God. So um, this book, actually this one was published in Nigeria because it was a lot cheaper for me to do it in Nigeria. Then I republished it here in the US and then I, um, I published another one called Identity, how to discover who you are. Your identity can be found in your dressing, the way you talk, the way you handle things because they say dress the way you want to be addressed. So the way you want to be addressed is people don't need to come close to you. They look at you. If, if you're in big size, they call you fat. If you're skinny, they call you leg. Now that becomes your name. The man at the pool of Bethesda, nobody knows his name. They just call him the man at the pool of Bethesda. The lady or the woman with the issue of blood, nobody knows his name. They call him what? Woman with the issue of blood. So whatever you allow ar around you is actually going to take your name. So if you want to be nice, just dress nice and then they will call you Mr. or Miss Nice. So this one is also, it's called, um, it's not over unless you say so. It's not over. This means whatever um, that's going on in your life, you can change it despite how horrible it is. Unless you say it is over, that's when it becomes over for you. But if you say, you know what, it doesn't matter what I've been through, I still want to fight. Nobody have the right to stop you. You only have the right to stop yourself. So the other one I really want to talk to you, I didn't print any pamphlet because I made it compulsory that everybody must buy my book. <laughs> yes, it's only $10. It's cheap because I got it from Nigeria. I talked about subconscious mind briefly. Um, I told you that conscious mind is the powerhouse of your life. That's actually what creates everything. That's what created whom I become. So I'm prone to say child of God. I know nobody is child of Satan. Child of God, you know what happened? When I focus on my future desire and dreams, that built me up. Subconscious mind, as you have it, is a part of your mind that doesn't sleep. So whatever you say, whenever you say it, it's saved. And then it's going to retrieve it back and use it for you. When you talk about consciousness, everybody you're here consciously, you're watching because you want to. You chose to be here. So whatever you learn here today is being transferred into your subconscious mind and it will be used for you when you need it. When you're sleeping, your subconscious mind is not sleeping. For those of us that like allow their kids to watch horror movie. What you're doing is to plant seed in their heart. It will grow. Any seed you plant, just give it time, it will grow. That's why in America you see kids who go to school and shoot other people because what? It, that seed has been sown in their head about shooting and bloodshed. So it's nothing to them. So whatever you plant, that's what you're going to reap. So don't say it's because I'm a black or green or blue. It's all your choice. There are people who are still black but they are doing good things here. They are trailblazers. So don't take your color for an excuse. Don't say because my parents divorced, my mother left my father, that's why things became tough. No, you can still change every ugly situation in your life. So I say that your subconscious mind is actually the one that does this job for you. And if you want detail, it's actually in this book. It's only $10. You can buy it for your children. It's very important. How does this work? You have what we call five senses. Your eyes, your nose, your skin, the way you, you feel, your, um, you touch, the nose, the smelling, the eyes, the sight, the mouth, the taste. 
So all these um, five senses, they are considered as USB. They are like USB drive that actually connected data or take data from the outside world into your soul or spirit. So whatever your eyes see will go down inside you. And when you need it, it will come back again. Some of us here, you bought cars sometime. The day you drive that car on the street, you will see everybody is driving this same car. Have you ever feel it? Like, you know, the day you wore red, you see everybody, red is everywhere. It's not because people have not been on that, but that's when your conscious mind is just pulling it out from the realm of the unknown into the known. So what I'm saying is that whatever you pay attention to will grow. So if you want to become something in life, focus on people who have developed exactly what you, have, you are looking for or what you want, and then you will grow be into becoming that particular person. So this data they collected is also something that we, you will, when you say, Bible said, as we have spoken, I mean, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth, what, speaks. So whatever you get from the outside is saved inside, and then it comes out from inside. Then you spoke, you, when you speak it, remember, we are creating being. God created us just simply by talking. So whatever you talk becomes your life. So for those of us who want to be Americanized and you say some negative things and you say, I'm just kidding. I want you to understand that subconscious mind doesn't know when you're serious and when you're joking. So whatever you say, it takes it for you and it will use it for you. So, you know, we have, like to sing song like um, Lady Gaga, song, one song, I love your, your disease. I like your, um, your crazy. I like your this. I like it bad. I want it bad, bad, bad. Crazy romance. That's the name of the song. And people dance. It, oh, oh, I like your crazy, I like your this, I like your that. When you start dating somebody and you think, oh, I miss you because I like your crazy, when they start doing crazy to you, you get angry. Why? You called crazy and crazy start coming to you. So don't blame the person. You projected what they give back to you. So if you don't want it, don't sing that song. Whatever you don't want, don't talk about it. If you don't want to be a failure, don't talk about failure. <laughs> Focus on what you want, and then you will get it for yourself. So more details, $10. God bless you. Say amen. Amen. So I'm going to introduce the next person. Igwe. Igwe Chinedu. God bless you. OK. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, I also thank the authors that have spoken before me, uh, Dr. Colin Isajimofo. Thank you for coming all the way from <laughs> Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, just uh, most of our members are scattered all over the United States, but uh, some of them one thing or the other, some ill, some. Uh, other events prevented them from being here, but they are here with us in spirit. Yes, my book, uh, Immigration to Citizenship of the United States of America, Your Resource Guide. And uh, that is the book that I wrote based on some experiences of immigrants coming into the United States, which is uh, a very overwhelming country different from what uh, we know or we've been around in our own continent of Africa. I, when I left Government College Omaha, which is where I'm from in the southeast of Nigeria, and went to the University of Nigeria and Soka in uh, Enugu State, <coughs> I had an experience there in my first year, and it, it was uh, we went into the school, that was in our first year. Then they asked us to come to a, a, f a information forum, which is like an orientation. <clears throat> so when we went there, the moderator asked us to look around the hall. We did, and uh, he said, the number of us in that hall is just not supposed to be the number that they're expecting. That we should have been bigger or more than what we have there in that hall and that 
so. Some other people must have gone away and they, they don't think it's necessary, the orientation is not necessary, they are in party, they are in town or something like that, but uh, that we are the wise ones because that in this university, University of Nigeria and Soka is a very big university, it's like a, a city. Uh -huh. So that you will see some students in the hostels, in the classrooms, taking lectures with you, showering with you in the hostels, but they are not students. That they are not students of the university, <clears throat> either they've been rusticated, either they've been rusticated from the university, or they're not even, their name is not on the register, because they've, they're not there. So you, if you keep following those type of people, you will think that uh, you, that's your, what a uh, schoolmate is doing. You're on your own. So that, that was the first time I had the word bona fide. <laughs> I say, they say that they are not bona fide students. So I, that, so I started to think about, that's when orientation came into my mind. I said, okay, orientation is very necessary. So in anything we do in this world, workplace, even family, yeah, when we have children, we still orient, orient them in our families. So that was where the idea of this book came around, to really orient our immigrant sisters and brothers, parents that are coming to the, into the country here, because the system here is very quite different from what we know, to really get some orientation. It's not that the book is going to say everything, but at least most of us that are here, we are working and stuff like that. And, uh, when they ask us, matter of fact, immigrants depend on family and friends to tell them what to do, what not to do, where to, where, what, I mean, where to go for resources. So I decided to really empower them on their self so that when they now talk, I mean, when you tell them some information, they can get it real quick. So that's what my book is all about. Uh, simple things as even the money. <laughs> the currency that is in use. For instance, when I got this information, the United States used to have 1,000 notes, single note. And uh, if you look at the book, you will see the ones that have been discontinued. Where we are now is from $100 bill down. But it used to be like $10 bill before. Uh, so it's here. and. Uh, you can imagine somebody coming into work, maybe in a gas station or in a restaurant, and then somebody else comes in and says, change this amount for me. That kind of a thing. And uh, you empty your drawer, well, McDonald's will fire the person in the next minute, and they still call police. So this type of information is necessary to really say, oh, this type of money is not even in circulation. And then other, other areas that needs uh, resources. Yes, because some people come in, they don't even know where to go for what they need. So the resources are available behind the book to really follow up. It's not that we're not going to tell them things to do. We will still tell them things to do, but they will you know, empower themselves, just like them being empowered by themselves a little bit. So, as, as we all said, I, well, I didn't tell myself my name initially. My name is Chinedum Igwe, and uh, it's because of actually the, this type of book that I've written that gave me the inspiration to say, hmm, authors, after working, doing all these things, writing and uh, staying awake, and uh, okay. we still need a place, a platform. African authors need a platform to where they can, at least once in a year, it's necessary, once in a year we come together like this, talk about our creative works, sell, and then interact. And that was how this association started. With Sally Eko, <laughs> a phone call with her, Matter of fact, the, 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 whole thing, the whole thing started this way. Maybe uh, let's, let's get, take a little bit step back. She called me sometime last year and said, do I know where Georgia Writers Association is? I said to her, hmm, I've heard about that name, but I don't know where they are, but I can look up for the, where they are, what they do, and then let you know. 
He said, she said, okay. Immediately I dropped the phone. This is just what, how International Association of African Authors started. I said to myself, hmm, every day, Africans are always following. Follow. Now, she's asking about Georgia Writers Association. Some people formed that association. And when she goes now, she's going to be from somewhere. And uh, I know how she will be in that association. I picked the phone and called her back. I said, Sally, this follow followed on too much. Can't Africans lead for once? Start your own. We are a very big continent. And we have the people. We have the resources. This, instead of, I, I said, light bulb, everything is one thing or the other, white or somebody else. So she said, that is good, though. And then I said, she said, okay, she will start calling some authors together. And I said, please, call everybody you can. Give me the information. Let me start following up. We started following up. Had our meeting, the first meeting, and started and started. Changed the names a little bit. Formated, formated it, right? You talk, talked about formation last time. Yeah. <laughs> formated the meetings. And then, finally, around some time, uh, middle of next year, last year, we, we pushed forward, registered the association, and started. And that is where we are today. Having a platform, the main purpose is discover African authors, promote African authors, and at least have a platform like this, where we can always meet annually and talk about our books. From talking about the books, we go further to marketing, selling. And it's not, I know that not everybody here will buy these books today, but they have you in mind now. If they need it, they, they, know, they know where to go, either through the association or through us individually. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we want to acknowledge other people that um, they are not here, but they've written several books, and we have those books here. Um, before we continue, I just realized we're going to have another presentation. And it's called Tales by Moonlight. Did anybody watch that program then? Tales by Moonlight. Tales by Moonlight. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good evening. Good evening. Good, evening. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I didn't learn French in high school. Oh, you didn't? <laughs> what happened? So unfortunately, when I got to college, I was asked to take elective. And my elective was in French. <laughs> and you know how it is when somebody from a different country comes to teach a language. Mm -hmm. They teach that language in their language. They don't mix it. I was in theater arts. And I was asked to take an elective in English, French. Every day I go to class. I had a cousin in that class. He did French in high school. So when we go to class, my cousin will interpret everything the French woman says because I will sit by him. Remember, I didn't do French in high school, so I don't have any knowledge of French language. Incidentally, one day the teacher said, if you come late to class, you are going to tell us how you prepare to come to school in French. That day, I went to school late. I went to the class late. And she stopped me. And remember, I didn't understand the word of what she said. My cousin interpreted for me. OK? So on the day I came late, she caught me. I was wearing a jeans pant and a t-shirt because I just finished rehearsal. So she said, tell us in French how you prepare to come to school. <laughs> remember, I don't understand the word of what she says. So I turned to my cousin and I said, Euclid. What did he talk? I, say, I said it in my native language. You can give me So my cousin told me what she said. Remember, I'm a theater artist. So what I did was I braced myself. I said, is it today or never? <laughs> yes, I braced myself. I relaxed. I took a deep breath. Because in theater, they say before you talk or before you sing, take a deep breath. So I wanted to speak from my diaphragm. <laughs> Everybody was waiting, and most, almost everybody in that 
auditorium, about 400 to 500 students. It's an elective. So English, people in English, uh, French, education, theater, history, everybody was there. I took a deep breath. Everywhere was quiet, just like it is quiet now. I said, Joe, wake up in the morning. <laughs> Joe, take my bath. No, Joe, say my prayers. Joe, take my bath. Joe, take my petit dictionnaire. Joe, go to school. That was my discussion. Awesome. I felt I felt French. <laughs> that it is still on my transcript till today. So, but that is not what I've come to do today. <laughs> For English. Yes. So what I've come to do today, most of us are conversant with our parents sitting down and telling us stories. All of you are writers, authors, and scholars, huh? Yes. I'm a storyteller. Mm -hmm. That is to say, we are all what? Storytellers. Yes. Because whatever book you write, you are telling a story. Yes. Whether it's fiction or non-fiction, yes. you are telling a story. And thank you to technology and thank you to Western education. We can write those stories down, publicize them. Uh, the editor will edit it. The line editor will edit it. The proofreader will proofread it. And it will go through self-publishing or other publishing. And then you sell. But let us go back to our tradition. Everything we did was oral tradition. History about families were tra transferred by oral tradition. Everything. Uh, I remember in Uzakoli, where I come from, during Ilosso, there's a, a festival we do during uh, two, twice a year. No, twice, once in two years. And you see some of the people who tell stories will begin to narrate stories of warriors from time Imo River. You know what I mean? And it was oral tradition from generation to generation. And most times, some of these stories they tell have morals to teach. And it was our early foundation for education. Because it was during, during that period that these stories were told that your parents, you learn to do what? Count. You learn to interact, social interaction. You learn to use your gross motor skills if you are a baby. Nobody teaches you how to drum. You do what? You watch people do what? You watch them draw. And that is why we educated our children. So today I'm going to tell you a story. And you remember, storytelling in Igbo culture or in most African cultures is call and what? Response. Mm -hmm. yes. There's a call and there's a response. But I'll get to that. Is that good? Yes. Good. So once upon a time, there was a lion. And the lion had a good friend. And that good friend is called, I'll say it in a typical Igbo language, mm -hmm. tortoise. 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 Americans call it what? Turtle or tortoise. Okay? But we call it tortoise. Okay? He's a good friend to the elephant, or to the lion. So one day he went to visit lion. And then lion, you know when we all kids, we always like to frighten our friends. You go, he's looking that way. Yeah. So he tried to frighten the lion. And the lion turned and said, hey, my friend tortoise, you think you can frighten me? Don't you know I am the king of the animals? Yeah, the king of the jungle. Tortoise said, don't worry. You mean I didn't get you? He said, yes, you didn't get me. He said, okay. Then the tortoise, uh, the lion said to Toto, tortoise, I'm going to get you. I am going to do what? Get you. He said, no, you can't do anything. You know I am the most cunning man on earth. You can't do anything to me. Before you even say it, I knew it. One month gone, two months gone, three months gone. He didn't frighten who? Tortoise. Then one day, Tortoise and his wife, Alia, and his first son <laughs> and his daughter were sitting and eating dinner. So you know what the lion did? The lion went and took this. The, the, the moon from the sky, yes, and put it on his head. And in theater, there's what we call suspension of disbelief, okay? There's suspension of disbelief. So whatever story I tell you, you've got to suspend your what? Disbelief, okay? So he took the 
the, the moon from the sky and put it on, on his head and took the stars and put on his body and then took a bell and put on his tail and then he left for the tortoise house. Bagam, bam, bagam, bam, bagam, bam. And then it was dark. You know how it is dark. Inside the house, there is light, but outside. Then Tortoise was sitting down and they were having dinner. And then he looked out and saw something. He said, whoa, or begin to be fire. What be this? So you know what he did? Everybody got frightened. And then he called his wife and said, Aliyah, my wife, go and see what is happening outside. <laughs> Aliyah said, hey. Nai, you know in Africa, the, ma the woman calls the man, Nai, our Lord. He said, my Lord, I don't know what it is, but I will go. So she went out and then, <laughs> So what I'm going to say, when she went outside and she saw, she didn't know it was a lion. She saw that statue, this, that sta saw that stuff there and she ran inside. And then the husband said, what is it? He was even afraid. Everybody was afraid. He said, what is it? He said, nah, amami fobo. All of you will say, bo mi saka, bo mi saka, bo. Nna, amami fobo. Bo mi saka, bo mi saka, bo. Amami fobo. Bo mi saka, bo mi saka, bo. Onwa di anisi. Bo mi saka, bo mi saka, bo. Babandu juru yahu. Bo mi saka, bo mi saka, bo. Bela koya nodo. Bo mi saka, bo mi saka, bo. Translation. Don't worry, I will. <laughs> I will tell you the story in English, but this one I will not translate. Come meet me later. <laughs> so what happened was that Aliyah came back and was afraid. So Tati said, look at it. Eh? Tomorrow you say you are the neck and I'm the head. You can't even go out there and see what the problem is. He said, oh, my son. Come here, my son, the next prince of the house. Come on, my boy. Go and see what is wrong outside. So the boy went, Amami Fobu. Amami Fobu. Amami Fobu. Amami Fobu. Amami Fobu. Onwadi Yanisi Bando Zuru Yaho Bella Ruya Nodu So that was what happened. So the, the son came back and couldn't tell what the problem was. Then the tortoise got up. I said, listen, I know sometimes there are some girls who are stronger some, than some boys. My dear daughter, Adanaya, come, go see what is going on. And then the daughter got out. Ah, she came back, the same scenario. Huh? She was what? Afraid also. She, she fright, was frightened and she ran back. Then thought he said, okay, I'm the man of the house. Meanwhile, his heart is in his stomach. <laughs> okay? He was shaking, and don't let me tell you what happened to his other... Okay? So, <laughs> when he got up, he was shaking. And he was, wanted to go. So, as soon as he stepped out, the lion removed what? What he was wearing. Mm -hmm. And said, yes, my friend. Frightened. I've frightened you. I got you. <laughs> I told you I was going to get you. And I did get you today. So, so, lion, it was you, huh? So you frightened my family. Uh, my wife almost ran out of the house. And my son, who I thought is so strong, uh, he couldn't hold himself. What is wrong with you, lion? Lion said, well, you started it. I told you. But you said, you're not going to be frightened. Ladies and gentlemen, that's the end of my story. But you know what? There is no story in our custom or in our tradition that doesn't have a moral, a moral uh, issue in it. So what did you learn from my story? Yes, I know that. <laughs> what did you learn from my story? Uh, when you start trouble, you expect it. Yeah, when you start trouble, you expect it. Yes, and doctor. Stop bragging. Stop bragging, yes, son. Anyone can be frightened. Anyone can be frightened, yes. Um, you, uh, you don't, you don't uh, make a statement you cannot uh, accomplish. Thank you, madam. Yes, madam. Uh, don't start something you can't finish. Don't start something you can't finish, yes? Uh, things can happen when you disrespect it. 
Think good, yes, yeah, son. Uh, humble yourself. Humble yourself. You see, from this, this, uh, yes. You don't mix English and French. <laughs> 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 you see, from this little story, we might expound it yes. to endless possibilities. Yes. And we learn each day from these stories our parents told us. So whenever you sit down, wherever you go, don't forget your origin. Yes. Don't forget where you come from. Yes. Like you said, if I told you a story, you see the story I told now? If me, the, Miseko goes out and tells this story. She's going to tell it in a different format. Mm -hmm. She's going to add something. She's going to add it. And it's not going to be Bomisaka. It could be Kumba, Kamba, Timba, Kamba, You know, it could be anything. It could be anything. So if you don't tell your story, nobody's going to tell it. And when somebody tells it, it's going to be from a different angle. Thank you very much and have a good day. For those of you who are not evils, or who are not Nigeria. I want to translate Bomisaka Bomisaka Go ahead, for you. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, that's a mixture of French and Igbo together. <laughs> so I want to acknowledge um, the arrival of our sweet brother, our father, our hard working, everything that you need him to be, Uncle James Uja. Let's just welcome him. God bless you, sir. So um, while we are taking the food, we want to acknowledge also um, the man that wrote the book, Passion of a Leader, Benson. And then 100 Pioneers Remarkable, Women of the Country. So these people are not here. So you can take a look at their, um, yes, they have the books here. The outstanding book prize was keenly contested. <laughs> no, but, 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 but it, it's amazing, all right? I, I think that was the best part for me in this whole project today, you know? You know, seeing, you know, you know the transparency, the zeal to vote, <laughs> and now I want to I want to encourage us. Please go, go out and vote on the sixth. Let's have the first black. It's a day. It's a date with destiny. Please go out and vote. Like Dr. Tessie wrote in her book, your destiny is in your hands. It's in your vote. It's in your card. You either make or ma the future and the destiny of your children yes. by what decision you take. Either to sit at home and hope every other person will do it or go out and do it and make that change. Thank you. That being said, I want to bring this meeting to an end tonight by giving this vote of thanks. I want to appreciate every one of us that made 2018 exhibition of the International Association of African Authors and Scholars a huge success. Though the beginning might be small, but our utter end is going to be amazing. Yes. It doesn't matter how many we are right now, but a time is coming when a place like this will not be enough. Yes. It's not even in the number, but it's in what the association, you and I, are able to achieve. What legacies we're able to leave behind. Right. We are trusting God that in no distant time, as resources begin to come and as the association begins to grow, that the dreams of building libraries across Africa Furnishing libraries across Africa. Of what use is our books if they are not read? No wonder they say if you want to hide anything from a black man, put it in a book. <laughs> black people, quote unquote, find it difficult to read. That's what they think, and that's what they want it to be. It's not so. But let me tell you, to some extent, it is. Yes. I live in the city of New York, where we jump trains and metro buses every day. I travel an hour on the train. 
with everybody, both white and black folks. From the start of the journey, 90% of the white folks on the train reading. are reading. Right. Reading books. On newspapers. Or reading something. Yes. Either on Kindle or physical hard copy. Or reading on their phone. But they are reading. Yes. The black folks are chatting away their time Music. on Instagram and on Facebook. Um, and some are dancing on the train. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. It's true. It's not like I live in Listen, it's, it's, it's crazy. And at the point I began to ask myself, this is in fact the difference. There is nothing you read that does not make or add to you every day. And that is why I had to reorient myself. I read something every day. It doesn't matter what. Yes. I give you a typical example. I stumbled on a paper on the street back some years ago and just picked up that paper. You know, it was just flying out and I just picked it and just glossed at it casually. It was not an in depth reading. Let me understand what the paper is. But I just glossed. But you know, when you do, some information sticks. Oh, yes. Two days later, I went in for an interview for a job. And in the process of the chat, they asked me a question. That the answer to that question came from the information I gleaned from the paper I glossed over two days back. On the street. On the street. Not something I have known and prepared for. But I just stumbled on that information, carelessly, casually. But it added to my knowledge and gave me an edge. <coughs> and so, what we are doing here today is not ordinary. It's not just for fun that we just didn't have uh, things to do and we just wanted to just come and bring people and sit down and talk. To some people, they might look, what are they doing? But we are indeed doing something. Listening to every author here present, present their papers, their books, their work, you begin to see the diversity of knowledge. Let me take a little time to break this down. What did we glean? Listening to Ubi Okwama talk about his book, The Case for Biafra's Restoration, he brought to bear some facts, some truths about the position right now of the quote unquote those fighting for the Biafran cause, the necessity, the importance, why we need to. It might have appealed to your conscience, and I must say, to a large extent it did, by reason of the voting that was just done. He was a top contender. Some people saw something interesting in it. That is knowledge assimilated, knowledge acquired. Chinedu Migwe's book on immigration it's a book aimed at opening the minds of young immigrants, fresh immigrants, who know not how to go about what it takes to settle in this country. It's a directional guide, it's a map. It's powerful. I listened to Saleko present a book that being black is not wrong, even when it was now and even in the future, telling us about the antecedents of slavery, certain facts that many people do not even know, why we are where we are. They say we are lazy, but every facet of the economy is being run by the black people. Food for thought. 
and the winner of the prize today, Dr. Jumofo, his work in human resource management brings it to bear that it doesn't matter what, it is this same intellectual resources embedded in human mind that brings to the manifestation of the actualization of everything we do. Without people, organizations will not run. It's a clear description that everything that has been done here today has impacted on our lives and is aimed at impacting on the lives of millions of people that will read these works today and in the future. And that is why we are hoping to make these resources available in the hands of people and online. In the nearest future, like I said when I was speaking in the morning, I said we look forward to when this association will bring the first African Nobel. We just saw from our own Lily to Gadrin, Dr. Jumafo do it today. And so it's going to be in that mega situation in the future. Amen. Let's keep doing what we are doing. Let's keep telling our story. Let's not relent. The lady that spoke, AJ Austin, made it very, very clear. Whatever it is, start writing. Put it down. It lives after you. We have read books for people that are past, and they still make impact. Yes, still reading. I was reading a write-up by Martin Luther King some weeks ago. The letter from the Birmingham prison. Oh my God. It was a huge piece. Martin Luther is gone. Then the knowledge left in that letter still speaks. Please, let's not relent. And I want to encourage everyone this evening that this association has come to stay. Amen. The vision and the mission that we have set, we are tenaciously pursuing with vigor. But we can't do it on our own. We need everyone's cooperation. We need everyone's involvement. That is why we, within Mind's words, in the motto of the association, we said, get involved. So what? You can get be heard. Involved. If you get involved, you'll be heard. We need you. Some people get so nonchalant about things that are in the startup stage. Because it might not be perfect. It might not be done to precision. There might be one or two hiccups, hitches, glitches, you know? But as we wobble, eventually we will stand. No child was born walking. No. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Unless you came from the other side. But what? They go through the process. They learn to raise themselves from the bed. And they, when they get tired, they fall. And eventually they learn to balance on four and they begin to creep. And when they throw their first steps, it's amazing. Everybody was, wow, he took his first step. And they wobble. And sometimes, even in the clapping, they get scared and they go, they go back to the ground. <laughs> but eventually, someday they get up. When they see others moving, and they move. And the journey begins. We are in that process. We are still wobbling. But we will stand and we will move. This organization, this association will soar. But it cannot go far without your cooperation, without your involvement, without your support. In every facet, everything is not money. But when you need to be there, you need to do anything, we need you. When we send out emails, Text messages. Response is expected. I'm glad that you made it today and we've been able to come this far. 
we are looking forward to 2019 exhibition and we hope that 2019 will be better Amen. in planning in organization in other things that we are looking forward to do and we hope to see you again in 2019 god bless you thank, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> members our father and our lord we thank you we give you praise we give you honor we give you adoration we celebrate you father for the opportunity that you have given to your people to gather here today lord we came safe and we finished our program now we are about to depart back to our various home we ask that the Spirit of God will guide us safely back to our various destinations. We also pray, O oh God, that this organization will continue to grow. This organization will be a trailblazer. This organization will bring out the best in the community. Lord, we thank you that whatever that we had today, that the young ones here, that they will hold on this and begin to produce the best in them. Father, we honor you because we know even before we pray, you already heard us. We ask for Johnny mercy. Let the blood of Jesus Christ be pleaded on the road, on the street as we go, that no weapon formed against us shall ever prosper. In Jesus' powerful name we have prayed. Amen. Amen.